Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm Lucinda Barnes, Chief Curator and Director of Programs and Collections at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, and I am delighted to welcome you to tonight's program, a conversation between the acclaimed artist and author Barbara Chase Rebu and BAM PFA Director Lawrence Rinder. The event is occasioned by our beautiful new exhibition, which you'll be able to see after, after the program tonight. Um, our beautiful new exhibition, which I've had the great pleasure of organizing for the Berkeley venue, an, an exhibition of monumental sculpture and drawing by Chase Rebu from her iconic Malcolm X Stell series. Chase Rebu was born in Philadelphia, where this exhibition originated last year at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. She currently lives in Paris, uh, where she moved in 1960 after completing her MFA in architecture at Yale University. She also studied at the uh, um, American Academy in Rome. In addition to her great acclaim as a visual artist, Chase Rebu is an accomplished poet and novelist. She first drew international attention for her controversial and celebrated book, historical novel, Sally Hemings, in 1979. Barbara has also won awards, including the Carl Sandburg Prize uh, for her poetry and for her overall achievements, the Women's Caucus for Art bestowed her a Lifetime Achievement Award. And in 1996, the French government made her a member of the Order of Arts and Letters. We are thrilled to have Barbara here with us from Paris. And I have to say it's been inspiring and an utter delight to work with her on the exhibition in tonight's program, which promises to explore the many facets of the Malcolm X Stell and her astounding creative activity. Finally, I want to thank the Andy Warhol Foundation for Visual Arts, for the Visual Arts, for their generous funding for the exhibition, and to Charles and Naomi Kramer, whose generous support has made possible its Berkeley presentation. And also special thanks to the French Consulate, San Francisco. And now, please join me in welcoming Barbara Chase Rebou and Larry Ripley. Thank you, Lucinda, and welcome, Barbara. Um, I'm not going to start at the very beginning, but I want to start in art school at Tyler uh, in Philadelphia. What was Tyler like at that time? What was the prevailing art ethos at, at art school when you were an undergrad? Well, uh, you know, the dean was the the dean was Boris Bly, who was a European uh, who had uh, Russian European who had escaped from war-torn, uh, war-torn, okay, war-torn Europe, Russia, and he had very, he had, he had very peculiar and very classical ideas about uh, art and how to make it. And he was, as a matter of fact, um, a wonderful mentor for, for me. Uh, he was a very hard-nosed professional sculptor who insisted that his students um, were classically trained. And so I, I, would, I was informed that I had to be a painter, an engraver, a draftsman, if I wanted to be a sculptor at all. Uh, I would have to learn how to draw first. And he, uh, and he instilled this in all of his uh, students. And he also had something which was very European, which was um, a sense of history and a sense of belonging to a tradition. And a tradition that went back as far as Judo, Judo Christianism, and the Roman Empire, and so on. So my uh, my whole training was extremely classical. Uh, I learned how to uh, sculpt in stone. Uh, 
I learned how to cast. Uh, I learned how to uh, sculpt in terracotta. And I, and the, these were things that were basic uh, to uh, what I wanted to do. And as Albert said at Yale much, much later, uh, if you want to be an artist, you have to think straight. And the only way of thinking straight is to know what your hand is doing at all times. So, uh, it's of course, appropriate you mention Albers because after Tyler, some few years later, you ended up at Yale getting yes. your MFA. And I wanted to ask what uh, you've described sort of the aesthetic uh, atmosphere at Tyler and the expectations. I presume it was very different at Yale under Albers. Uh, did you work closely with Albers or what, what was the uh, atmosphere there? It was not so different. I would say that there was, uh, there was a connection between Bly and Albers. They were both Europeans. They were both very stern and very, um, and very insistent taskmakers. They both had their ideas about what an order should be and how, how uh, they should react. So that the color studies of Albers um, sort of complemented, I would say, the classicism of Boris Bly. Because they both depended on a kind of a formulas and a rigorous analysis and well they depended on formula they pretend they pretend they depended also on analysis and on on simply work you know on work on volume on they expected uh, they expected you to work their part and at that time you were, you were studying architecture so how did how did that happen how did you get into being involved with architecture well, uh, I had been in Rome, and uh, someone from the architecture department at Yale said that I should, I should go to Yale. And so I finally did. I was accepted. Uh, I had a fellowship and so on and so forth. And um, so I went, to, uh, I went to Yale, and I started off as an architect. Uh, and one of my professors uh, was Jane Sterling, uh, a British architect, um, who decided that women shouldn't be architects to begin with. But they should be uh, wives. He, didn't he ask you to marry him? Yes, well, um, <laughs> we had a little bit of differences on this. And uh, finally, uh, he convinced me that um, that I, I should be a sculptor, but not an architect. And then I decided the same thing. Well, that's good. So you saw it eye to eye on at least that. Uh, on one thing. On one thing. <laughs> and uh, I believe Eva Hesse was a student at the same time you were at Yale. Did you know her? And did you talk about sculptural things with her? Who? Eva Hess. Uh, she was a uh, student. Eva, he no, Eva Hess was slightly. Um, I think she graduated yeah. one year before you, but you would have overlapped yeah. one year. Uh, yes, but she was in the art school, and I was in the architecture you were school. Architect. We had no, we had no um, contact. Mm. What about Sheila Hicks? I know she became a friend, and was she at, at Yale when you were there? On the contrary, Sheila was there my uh, first year at Yale, and we became very close friends for for many many years. For many many yeah. years. And then I know that uh, you began traveling even before you got to Yale and became probably one of the most well-traveled artists in history. <laughs> um, you've been everywhere. When did your experiences uh, with, uh, you know, getting into contact with global cultures outside of the, you know, Judeo-Christian or the Western mainstream, mm -hmm. when did that begin to influence your work? Did that happen before Yale, or was it a slow oh, development? that happened before Yale. That happened uh, while I was in Rome at the American Academy. Uh, I was sort of challenged by a couple at the Academy um, to get out of academia and to get out of my classroom and to really look at the world uh, as, 
as a traveler. And so they, they sort of said, well, you know, if you really want to see the world, uh, come with us. And we're going to Egypt uh, tonight. Tonight. Uh, you know, and I, we dare you, you know, to do it. And so I ran up the stairs. I put a few things in a bag. I ran downstairs. And I got on the boat for Alexander with them. And at the end of the voyage, um, we were standing on the wharf. And they finally said, well, Barbara, goodbye. And that was the end of it. And I was stranded in Alexander um, in the midst of the Suez Canal War. Uh, and you were how old? I was 19. <laughs> I was 19. And so what does an American girl do uh, if she's stranded, you know, somewhere in a strange country? Well, I went up to the first policeman I saw, and he took one look at me, and he said, Hilton Hotel. <laughs> and that's where I ended up, in the lobby of the Hilton Hotel in, in Alexandria. Uh, and a very distinguished uh, gentleman came up to me and said, what are you doing, you know, running around uh, Egypt unescorted? Where's your mother? And I said, well, my mother is in Philadelphia, um, and I'm here. And he said, well, if you don't want to end up in a harem somewhere, you better go straight to the YWCA. Uh, I'm going to put you on the train. Uh, I'm going to put you on the train for Cairo. You go straight to the American Embassy and don't budge. And that's what I did. Happily, at the American Embassy, uh, the cultural attaché decided to take me under his wing and he brought me home to his wife. And I stayed in Egypt for almost three months. I made a historical voyage up the Nile as far as Khartoum, and it changed my life, of course. And nothing has been the same since. And then, at a certain point, you moved to Paris. Uh, how did that come about? And you still live in Paris. So what took you there, and what kept you there? I was a runaway bride. And I went to uh, Paris for the weekend, and I never came back. I met my first husband. And that was the end of that. That was the end of London, as a matter of fact. But one of the reasons you stayed in, in Europe, if not in Paris, was because of the uh, availability of craftsmen that you could work with, particularly casting uh, people who knew the fine art of, of bronze casting. Is that, is that right? Well, the, the first, my first experience with bronze casting was, of course, at Tyler, because I had to learn uh, the technique and I had to learn how to do it myself. Of course, when I arrived in Europe and realized that there were foundries, um, you know, there were tremendous foundries who could do practically anything that I chose to do, then it, then it became uh, a matter of finding the right foundry, which was a foundry in uh, Verona, in Italy, which I used for many, many years. And how did you find the, the art culture of Paris in the 1960s? And was it then that you first became uh, influenced by surrealism or connected to the currents of surrealism? Uh, I think so. I was very lucky in that I was introduced into uh, the French art world, uh, very young, by Francois Stali, who was a um, French sculptor. And by Henri Cartier-Bresson, who was sort of my surrogate father-in-law. And so I met, you know, I, I met all the surrealists. I met Giacometti. I met Max Ernst, uh, you know, and You were close with Man Ray, right? You were, you were friends. Well, Man Ray came later. Man Ray came, uh, came much later. Uh, with uh, in another life, let's mm. put it that way. <laughs> so, um, 
you know, in America, shamefully, it was difficult for many years for a woman to be successful in the arts. In fact, I think you're the third woman in American history to have a solo show at, at a museum. Yes. Uh, was it the same in Paris? Did you have to deal with misogyny and among the surrealists or any other people? Uh, I think the misogyny uh, existed everywhere. But um, in, in France, uh, and especially in Paris, uh, it was much more uh, free, much more liberal, much more. There, there was a history of uh, women intellectuals, women artists, and one of the first shows uh, of the American uh, was at the Musée de d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris, uh, which I did in 1974. So I know that also in 1966 you were featured in the first festival of black arts in Dakar that was organized by Leopold Senghor. Did, yes. you, did you know Senghor? I mean, he's such a fascinating character, a surrealist poet who became the first president of Senegal. Exactly. I mean, it, he has a fantastic biography. And I didn't meet him, actually. Um, he had decided, uh, he had written a, you know, a seminal book on negritude, mm -hmm. and he had decided that he wanted to do this big uh, art festival, yeah. which was the first of its kind, and I was invited as an American, not as a French woman, but a, as an American uh, by the U.S. Congress um, to participate in this, uh, in this exhibition. Did you go to Dakar, to the festival? Uh, I did go, and um, it was, you know, it, it was uh, mind-boggling you know, because uh, you had uh, the whole African continent. Um, didn't didn't Duke, Duke Ellington play at the at the festival? Everybody played. Mm -hmm. There was every everybody. It must have been played. an amazing amazing there. thing. Nobody wanted to miss this. Yeah, yeah, and uh, nobody did. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact. Yeah. Well, I did. I was five at the time, but. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about the work in the show. Uh, this work. So. Uh, these are some of the earliest works in the exhibition from 1966, so actually the same year as the festival in Dakar. And they're from a series called Le Lit, which means the bed in French. And uh, they're wonderful drawings. All of your drawings are, all the ones I've seen. You have a wonderful hand, and these are particularly uh, beautiful. And one of the, the characteristics that you can note in the works, even in the few that we have in the exhibition, is that some are more figurative, as the work on the left, and others more abstract. So can you talk about that relationship, and did one of those modes precede the other? Did they start figurative and become abstract, or vice versa? Uh, well, these two drawings are from uh, my first exhibition in uh, Paris, which took place in 66, when I was still uh, very much under the influence of surrealism, uh, the sculptures themselves w were sort of Giacometti-ish, uh, and these drawings were the first indication that I was going abstract. Uh, and so, as you can see, from the sort of almost naturalistic drawing of Lily to the right, uh, the drawings evolved into uh, what is on the left, which is, which is practically um, abstract. Right. So although abstract on the right, yeah. yes, right. Sorry. Right. <laughs> so they did ev evolve in that direction. The earliest ones were the figurative yeah. ones, and then they, they moved forward. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then another work in the series, this one, uh, which seems more abstract than figurative, but it is also different from the other two in that the bed seems to be pushed up to the picture plane. It seems as if it's uh, sort of levitated and become horizontal, especially if you compare it to these, which really do look like they're receding mm -hmm. into space in perspective. And this comes up towards the, uh, you know, the picture plane. Can you talk about that and that shift towards verticality from horizontality? Well, it's not just a shift toward verticality. I think it's a shift toward levitation, which, mm. uh, which, which sort of precedes uh, the stels. 
in a way, now that, I, now that I'm looking at it. Uh, for, uh, first of all, it, the, the bed or the square seems to be floating in space with the, you know, with the abstraction of floating in the floating. And I think that this is, this is what I wanted to do, but didn't know quite how to do it, was to get the sculpture up off the floor and off the base and how and how how was I going to do that? Yeah, we'll come back to this theme of floating or levit levitation throughout the the, the conversation. And it, it does seem to me to be really one of the most vital essences of your art is this movement upward and the sense of things rising somehow in space mm -hmm. or in the mind. No, I I agree. So this is one of the first Malcolms, but it's number two in the series, is that? It's is number it? two in mm -hmm. the series. The first uh, Malcolm was still on its base. It was a horizontal mm -hmm. piece, uh, but it was still, you know, anchored to the floor uh, by a base. This was the first uh, stele that is vertical and that is levitating. That is, uh, that is the sculptural element is being held up by uh, by the fiber, which of course is impossible. Right. Um, so some people who may not have seen the show yet, and uh, this slide looks a little hard to read, may not realize that the upper part is made of bronze and the lower part is, is fiber, uh, wool. Wool. In, in this case. It's black wool, yeah. Braids of, of wool that cascade down. And so there's the, the effect visually or cognitively is that the piece is standing on, on fiber. It's standing on air. Standing on air, right. Yeah. It does have the quality of levitation because mm -hmm. you look and you think, well, obviously it can't stand on fiber. Fiber's not stiff. It contradicts your expectations. How, and the, just also the, the combination of the bronze and the fiber is such a provocative duality. How did you arrive at, at, at this well, as, as I said, since I was moving towards uh, abstraction and my goal was to get the abstraction uh, up off the floor and free from the base. And so I had to find a way uh, <laughs> to keep it up there. And, you know, on and an hide arm, the legs. Yeah. And get rid of the legs, which was what was anchoring not only uh, the sculpture, but intellectually and poetically uh, anchoring, anchoring the piece, anchoring the art. And I read somewhere that Sheila Hicks uh, had some, there was some point of contact with you and Sheila where she helped you to get to this point? Uh, no, I had gotten to this point. I just didn't know what to do, how to hide the armature. I see. And she uh, said, well, why don't you try to hide it mm. um, with fiber? Mm. I will show you one knot, mm. okay? And, you know, take it from there. Had, had you worked with fiber before? or would I had never worked with fiber before. It never had occurred to me, mm. um, which was why these sculptures were still on the bases mm -hmm. or on the floor mm -hmm. because what happened was the you know the the as i got more into the abstraction the only thing i could think was to put them on the floor mm -hmm. which i did and one of the most famous ones the one that that you know uh, that sort of started me off in, in the 60s was bathers um which is polished uh, aluminum um, bricks, uh, you know, sort of two feet by two feet, which were placed uh, on the floor, and then between the bricks, uh, mm. uh, there was silk um, mm. meandering. Mm. Like water. Like water, water mm. or like swimmers. Mm. Um, and so this was the first vertical mm. mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that I did. This was the third? And this was number three. Number three. And in number three, everything came together, uh, surprisingly enough. Um, it was the color of the silk. It was the, fe it was the polish of the bronze. 
and suddenly the silk took on all the appearance of the bronze and the bronze took on the fluidity of the, of the silk and you had this interaction between the two, which was magic. Yeah. I was looking at one of the pieces today and noticed that there are moments where the bronze actually reflects the silk next yes. to it mm -hmm. and, and it really becomes wonderfully complex and involved. And what is also true is that the silk reflects the reflection mm. of the bronze. Mm. Yeah. And so you have, this, you have this interaction, which most of the time works. And if it doesn't work, it means that the sculpture has failed uh -huh. somehow. Yeah. So I, it's very interesting because on the one hand, these sculptures and the way the relationship between the textile and the bronze and everything we've been talking about are the solutions to a very particular problem to the evolution of abstraction in relationship to surrealism. So it's a very 20th century problem and yet uh, there are some very other uh, non-European and non-20th century precedents for this work like this Sanufo exactly, mask. Exactly, yeah. Which, uh, you know, this is a dancing mask which means that uh, it completely covers uh, the the person, the human, which is uh, which is under the the fiber and the mask, and it, it it's so that the the sculpture itself moves in a way uh, that that sort of disenchants it from everything, and it becomes um, it becomes a spirit. Mm -hmm. It becomes something that is not. Um, of this world. Another fascinating precedent, possibly, is uh, the Venus from the Louvre, I believe, which you must have been very familiar with. I was very familiar with, uh, uh, with Venus and with, with other, um, other winged, you know, the winged victory, mm. which I used much later in Africa Rising. I used uh, I used the, the sort of um, the 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 whole idea of winged victory is the Nike at the top of Africa Rising mm. in New York, right. you know. which we'll see at the end. So uh, one of the the striking things which we've been talking about is the relationship between the bronze and the and the textile, and this relationship between uh, sort of the hard material and the soft material between. Uh, stone and rope continues into your drawings as well. Can you talk about this particular sort of thematic connection between stone, stone and rope? What do these symbolize for you, these images and their relationship? Well, I think it's more a question of material. Mm -hmm. It's more a question of hard and soft and fluid and rigid than it is uh, stone and cords. Okay. But as as these, you know, as I had to illustrate um, the fiber in some kind of way, and it was very difficult to do it unless I did make cords, and it was something that um, that seemed to work very well poetically, mm -hmm. because it, because of of all the associations, mm -hmm. um, I did a series of drawings. This one is this one is from MoMA, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. um, I did a series of drawings beginning in the early 70s uh, of stone and and cord, mm -hmm. and then the cord took on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. So in these drawings, in this one in particular, the cord really does have a, the quality of water. It reflects back mm -hmm. to the bathers you were talking about, but in in others, the cord is really a binding. Uh, material. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, and in that regard, it, it calls to mind this Man Ray piece, the Enigma oh, well, Isidore Ducasse. I have one drawing which is really a, a, a homage to Man Ray. And to who, this work in particular. Yeah, and to this work in particular. Um, and, uh, you know, he was someone uh, whom I revered and who was very close to my husband. And uh, you know he had these beaux mots that that were so uh, that were so typical. He had one, 
which I love to uh, imitate because people will always ask him, well, why do you live in Paris? Well, he, was why Paris? he was American, uh, right? He was from Philadelphia. And uh, everybody asked me the same thing. Well, you know, why Paris? Why, you know, why are you here, actually? And uh, so he had a very good answer, which was, um, j'aime être étranger which means, and he, he would do it with a heavy, you know, American accent, j'aime et étranger, which means I love being a foreigner. <laughs> and uh, that was his answer. That's my answer, as yeah. a matter of fact. So this is uh, the piece in our collection, which we love. I think 1972, if I'm not mistaken. The title is Confessions from Myself. No, 73. So it's 73? The same, yeah, okay. It's the same year of the show. Yeah, was here. because it was commissioned for the for show. For the show, okay. And um, So how did that show come about? I um, actually, I walked into Peter Selt's office who was the director of this new, brand new museum at Berkeley. And I said to him, I would love to have a show here. <laughs> and um, he said to me, well, you know, I've seen your things at Betty Parsons in New York, and I wanted to meet you. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, here I am. Yeah. No, it's really quite amazing. Peter was telling me, Peter's right here, hi, Peter that uh, he actually just the day before or that day had yeah. seen the ad for your, your show mm -hmm. in New York and had thought, I'd really love to meet this woman. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you walked in the door. Yeah. It's amazing. It and then, so the, the show that was here in 1973 um, included many works, but this work was commissioned specifically for, specifically for that exhibition. And it has never, as far as I know, moved from, from, from the Berkeley. Yeah. Right. So it shares many qualities with the Malcolm pieces. It has the bronze on top and the textile mm -hmm. on the bottom, but it's not one of the Malcolms. So how, no. is, how is it different? What are, from your perspective, what makes it not a Malcolm Stelle? Uh, because I say so. Okay. <laughs> uh, because it's deeply personal, um, because uh, the configuration of, uh, of the um, bronze is totally different uh, because I was beginning uh, to sort of, um, there, there, there was something moving and, and, and sort of emotional about the Malcolm II. And it was it's sort of soft. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, you know, with confessions, I got a little harder. Mm -hmm. And I got a little more hard edge. Mm -hmm. And a little bit more, I think, um, confessional. Mm -hmm. And that's why I called it Confessions mm -hmm. for Myself, because mm -hmm. it seemed to me that it was coming from a different, from a different angle. More personal? Than more subjective. personal, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So tell us a little bit about how the bronze is made to look like this. It's remarkable that the, the characteristic that you get out of the medium, how, how do you arrive at that? Well, I start off with very large um, wax sheets, uh, which are about a quarter of an inch thick, uh, which is more or less uh, the thickness uh, that bronze should be when it's cast. And this technique is called lost wax. Uh, the uh, object is made totally in wax and then is encased in uh, plaster. Uh, the wax is melted out and the bronze is poured in, which means that each piece is unique. Uh, there's no way to make uh, an addition. And it also means that if the workers make a mistake and do not pour at the right temperature at the right time when the moon is, mm -hmm. you know, high or whatever, and you will have a mess because it will not pour and you have lost your sculpture. And you make very large sculptures, so there's a lot and at these, stake. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot, a lot at stake. Yeah. Uh, these are not small sculptures. This, scu this sculpture is what must be 
what, 10 so, feet tall? Yeah, 10 at least. 10, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, there are several series represented in the show. This is from the Tantra series. It is a series, right? The, the, there are more uh, the Tantra, yes, yes. Uh, is a series. There are, four, uh, there are four, and there will be more. There will be, there more. Will be more, yeah. And so tell me about this, how you arrived at this form, and how you applied the title of Tantra to these particular works. Well, I think this is uh, my attempt at Orientalism, or, or Orientalism, and uh, it comes from several poems that I did I at that time, and I was interested in uh, in this sort of circular uh, form, which is typical of tantric um, art, and that was that was it. This, this is an older uh, piece that was re, -con re you know, configured uh, into this, into this form, into the, the you know, the circular form. Mm -hmm. And then the rest just seemed to, seemed to flow from that. It seemed to need uh, something to hold up the, the circular form. And then it, it seemed to need the column uh, to hold up the sculpture. So you've talked uh, a couple times in the past few days, you've mentioned uh, Baroque art and presumably architecture as maybe a more recent influence, but I see some elements of this compared to the Malcolms, let's say, reminds me of aspects of Baroque art or architecture. Oh, I think so. I mean, uh, I, it, at the time, uh, I think that I was already, I was certainly casting in, in bronze in Italy, and I may have even been uh, living part-time in Italy. And so I was a very, in, very sort of influenced by Baroque art. Mm -hmm. And um, this is, yeah, uh -huh. this and is the result. Any artists in particular that you love from the Baroque period? All of them. All of them. <laughs> right. <laughs> So this is one of my favorite pieces in, in the show, and it's one of the most recent, 2008. Uh, yes. All, that's mm -hmm. All That Is Rising Must Converge is the title, which is a wonderful title. Um, yes, yeah, so the title, All That Is Rising Must Converge. So again, that sense of levitation and things rising and, and converging. But then also the color here is very striking and new, both of the textile and the bronze. Well, uh the uh, the red comes from the fact that my my foundry uh, workers said that they had found a red patina mm. and that they could do it and I said well do it if you can do mm. it it's very beautiful <laughs> and they came up with um, with a red patina mm. for what is uh, gold bronze mm. and once I saw that color I mean it was mm. it was ac actually normal uh -huh. you know it was it was a piece of cake yeah. to think okay it's a red mm -hmm. it's a red Malcolm it's yeah a, it's a red sculpture have you made more with that patina I am in the throes of making a new one mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. uh, which is in the foundry Wonderful. which will have uh, a red skirt to it and I have several small smaller um, sculptures that are red mm. So this is another series of drawings, the monument drawings, and they're wonderful. We have many of them, I'm happy to say, one whole, whole wall. Uh, but the way that they're made is quite unique. So can you talk about how they're made? Uh, and then we'll talk about what they are. Well, they are in, you know, sort of basically charcoal drawings made with charcoal and charcoal pencil. But these particular drawings have an element which is engraved on the paper before I start the drawing. And then the drawing flows in and around this one element, um, which is in every single you know, monument drawing. Right. And there are 50 monument drawings? There are 25 oh, monument 25. drawings. 25. And so you first made uh, essentially an addition of 25 uh, prints yes, of the exactly. same motif exactly. and then used those for 25 different drawings. For, for 25 different drawings, yeah. So I'll 
show two more and try to see if you can where the repeated element is. So it is, I'll, I'll tell them, okay? <laughs> okay, <laughs> don't make them guess, okay. It's the bottom part there with the horizontal striated rope-like lines and the, we can call them rocks on either side, although I think Strictly speaking, well, they're neither uh, rocks there, nor ropes. There's, there's one um, sort of article in the catalog which calls them bones. Bones. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, it's a good um, description because my sculptures also have mm -hmm. involved uh, and have evolved yeah. from the sculptures of the 60s and 60, 60, 66, mm -hmm. 67 when I did use um, real bones, mm -hmm. bones and, plasti right. and plaster, right. uh, to make these kind of figures, uh, kind of surrealistic figures. Right. And, uh, Before you started casting. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, one of the great Baroque uh, interiors are the, the, in Rome, and I guess in France also, they have the bone chapels, which... Uh, yes, although I don't think they... In I don't think that they influenced, influenced me at mm, all. Mm. It, it was more Barini. It was more uh, people working in um, in marble mm. and doing these extraordinarily Baroque mm. Uh, mm. Uh, figures, draped figures, mm. Um, mm. you know, uh, corded mm. figures, mm. etc. Right. Okay. Well, back to these. So one of the distinctive things about these. Monument drawings is the presence of writing or something that looks like writing. And I read somewhere you use this term, I presume it's your own term, literaturization. Uh, can you talk about what that means to you and what the presence of writing in these drawings signifies? Well, it means just what I say, uh, that abstraction uh, can only go so far and that there is a turning point where uh, abstraction turns into poetry and a kind of literalization that goes with that goes with poetry. Otherwise, uh, you're out there alone, or you're out there in conceptual mm -hmm. I don't know what. Mm -hmm. um, so that so that that's really uh, how it began. And also, I, I had wanted to um, include real poetry. Mm. Which you did in, in into some of these. these. drawings. Mm -hmm. um, my first book of poetry was published in 74. And I began almost immediately uh, to incorporate lines or words into the automatic writing. Mm. And then I started incorporating cold poems mm -hmm. into the um, into the into the drawing. So talk a little bit about the automatic writing. That's of course a surrealist methodology for eliciting subconscious images. Exactly. I mean, it is a surrealistic uh, uh, sort of almost an exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, this writing g goes from right to left. In these drawings, you've written it from right to left. Yes. Why? I don't know. <laughs> Let Ford figure it out, <laughs> but the you know the bottom line is um, that uh, Arabic, which is written mm. in the same way from from right to left, uh, uh, has a word for God, which is a gesture I imagine um, that comes from you know th th that comes from. Uh, eternity or comes from f comes from so long ago and there are several people who remarked that in this uh, you know in this automatic writing which has no meaning mm -hmm. uh, that the word in Arabic for God um, occurs all the time mm -hmm. And so they wanted to know what this had to do with my sculpture. And I said, I don't know. <laughs> it's just there. Yeah. So these monuments, uh, 
in the titles, there's the name of a person, sometimes a fictional person, but you told me that you named them after the fact. You did not make the drawings in reference to particular people. No, as a matter of fact, uh, it, was the, it was absolutely the, the contrary. Uh, I wanted to make uh, monuments uh, to people who should have had monuments but who didn't, and for one reason or another um, had been suppressed from history either by gender, uh, by color, by race, uh, by politics. And so uh, they were all named after the fact. Uh, they just looked right or they sounded right. So do you remember who, whose monument this is? Uh, this is Hadrian's. Hadrian. Oh. Yes. Uh, this, well, I can read this one, thank uh, goodness, because I didn't remember who it was. Uh, who was it's a Cardinal oh, Ricci. Cardinal Ricci, right. Oh, and then this, this is a very important piece in New York, uh, Africa Rising from 1996. 90, yeah, 98, 90, it was installed, I think, it was installed in 97. Yeah, mm -hmm. so tell us about this, this piece. It's probably, it's your largest piece by, by far. Uh, it is. Is it my largest piece? Yes, it is my largest piece. It was the result of a competition um, which uh, the federal government, um, you know, sort of initiated in order to, in order to memorialize uh, the African burial ground, which was found in New York under Wall Street. And uh, as they had already started to build a federal building, on the site, uh, they were, um, you know, they were forced actually uh, to stop building uh, and to do uh, anthropological studies of uh, the graveyard and then to memorialize it. So there were 500 other sculptors um, in the competition and um, this is the result. And I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I read that uh, between the time you started working on this or between the time that the graveyard was discovered and the whole thing being finished, the things that had been found in the cemetery were taken to a site uh, and all of it was lost in the September 11th attack. A great deal of it was lost, was lost at, in, yes. in that attack. But, but and this, this, this is all, this is yeah. what's left. This is what's left. Amazing story. So, uh, I'd like to have some time to get questions from the audience, but I want to mention that there's a whole, at least two other dimensions of your life and work, which we haven't really talked about at all, which is your novels and your poetry. Barbara won the Carl Sandburg Prize for the Best American Poet. Her novel, Sally Hemings, sold millions of copies and changed American history. So we didn't talk about that. No, we're but not going to talk about that. <laughs> but maybe some of you have questions about Sally Hemings or the poetry or anything you'd like to ask Barbara. This is your chance. So. Uh, I do have two wonderful volunteers with microphones on either side. So if you raise your hand, please wait for the microphone to get to you before asking your question so everyone can hear. And then hold the mic like this. Very important to hold the mic like this so that people can hear you. So questions? Yes. Can you tell us the uh, outcome of the Middle Passage Monument for DC? What's happened with that? Uh, the outcome. Uh, the, uh, well, it's still available. I would still like to build it somewhere in the United States. Uh, the, um, the idea was to build eight of these in eight different American um, cities. Whoever had the money and the will to do it, uh, the, the monument itself, uh, is a monument I thought of many, many years ago. Uh, and um, I'm just hoping that one day um, I'll, be able to, I'll be able to build it. And it's like an a enormous arch in a sense, right? A, a kind of a... No, it's an H. An H, an H. but it's you can walk H. underneath the, the horizontal, right? It's very uh, large. It's like two stels. Uh -huh. And then there's a bridge between the two stels 
uh, along which is wound a chain of 11 million links, which, uh, which represent the 11 million um, deaths uh, of the Middle Passage. And the H, of course, also stands for Harar, the ancient uh, African city. And inscribed on the, on the two stels are the names of all the rivers and all the nations uh, that were involved in the Middle Passage. There was a question here in the middle, I think. Yes, right here. So just wait for the mic. I'm most taken by your fearlessness. You don't speak of hesitancy or at all being held back by your race or gender. Can you talk about that a bit? Uh, I don't understand. I didn't understand the question. I she mean, said you, you have no, if I may paraphrase, there's no quality of hesitancy. You, you walked right into Peter's office, for example. You just, uh, you just go for it, as we say today. And uh, uh, No, I didn't burst into Peter's well, office. Well, no, <laughs> we're not accusing you of being <laughs> impolite. But you, you, do, <laughs> you do have a quality of fearlessness. And in, in, a, in a world which has not always been kind to women or people of color, you have just done, you know, what you wanted to do. Well, it was, it's my grandmother's fault because she told me at a very young age that fearlessness was politeness, that you do not let people know that you are carrying a heavy burden, that that is a third world attitude towards life. And that, and that was it. Thank you. Yes. I've been uh, very much drawn by the, um, the, uh, the metal and the fiber talking to each other in your work. Um, and all of the modulation, just, it just seems very uh, virtuosic. Um, how did you find your way with the fiber um, so uh, amazingly? Um, and how does that relate to um, meaning in your work with all the braiding, the cording, the knotting? I, th I think that it was pure uh, magic. Uh, I didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, when I combined these two things together, I did not know uh, that these skirts were going to end up uh, imitating the bronze, or that the bronze was going to end up imitating the skirts. Uh, when the first time I put them together um, was, you know, the black Malcolm II, but it wasn't until Malcolm III that I realized that I had found, you know, my um, signature sculptures. And it was magic because um, it was not until the last thread was stitched onto the last piece of bronze that the transformation took place. And you do all of the, the thread work yourself. You don't all have the, assistance, yes. all the knotting, all yes. it's all. All the knotting, all the, all the thread work, all the knots. As Sheila said, I'm going to show you how to do one knot, <laughs> and you take it from there. And that's exactly, I only use one knot, as a matter of fact. Um, and the rest is cords and, and braids and so on and so forth. More questions? In the middle, right, right back there. Hello. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about your idea of abstraction. You were saying that it can go so far and then it relates to poetry, and I wonder if you mean to metaphor or to an associative meaning, or if you can elaborate at all on that. Uh, you're gonna have to interpret that. Okay, <laughs> well, I think the question was uh, the, the, the point at which abstraction turns itself over to poetry, and what is that, that transition to poetry, and does it lead to metaphor? Uh, what happens at that point? 
Uh, I think that's part of the mystery of uh, these objects. I have no idea. It is like the transformation of uh, the hard and the soft. Uh, the moment that uh, the bronze becomes liquid and the fiber becomes solid is a moment which I cannot anticipate, but which usually happens, not all the time. And um, this metaphoric uh, transformation is something that makes that makes the object. And There's which, and which, as a matter of fact, I have no control over. I mean, I'm as surprised as you are. There's someone way in the back. I don't want to miss out on someone just because they sat in the back of the theater. Uh, pardon, I came in a little late. I hope I didn't miss something that uh, you've already covered. Uh, could you help us understand or help me understand, as you were in the uh, art and architecture school, of Tyler School of uh, Art at Tempe University, kind of a little bit about most artists have a particular medium they start with as they grow and develop and then come to, she came to sculpture. What uh, was your art? Uh, uh, related to in Tempe? Were you in uh, charcoal, pastels? What was your medium then in school? Uh, we haven't seen what your early art was as you progress to uh, where you are now. That is a very long question. <laughs> yeah, I, And we did actually talk about this. He was talking yeah. about what you were doing at Tyler. Uh, what kind of art did you have a particular medium at Tyler? But you did everything at uh, Tyler. I did everything. I had no medium. Uh, I think that I tended toward uh, sculpture, but uh, I did a lot of engraving. I even did some painting. And then I realized that I had no uh, affinity to color whatsoever. Uh, so all my paintings were going to be black. <laughs> and. Um, I think that uh, the thing to remember is is the thing of Albers, that you have to learn how to think straight before you can do something that you can call uh, an art object. And if you don't have the foundation, uh, if you, and if you don't have the craftsmanship, and you don't have the foundation, and if you don't have the will, um, then you ought to change. Um, then, then you ought to change jobs. So we'll take a few more, and then we've got the reception where Barbara will be, and you can ask her questions one, two, and three, and then we'll go. So, yes. Peace, my sister. Thank you for coming. Uh, Malcolm X, I love him for many reasons, particularly his stance against the myth of the system of white supremacy um, and the fact that he stood against American imperialism. Uh, why Malcolm memorialized for you? Well, Malcolm is a world figure, uh, a world historical figure. Why shouldn't I memorialize Malcolm X? Uh, um, Stells, uh, historically and in many civilizations, uh, do just that. Uh, they take a historical figure and they memorialize what this figure has done in their own civilization or in, in history in general. And so um, Malcolm, to, and especially because I was in Europe when he was assassinated, so it was even more, um, more hurtful and more, uh, more devastating to me being away from America and having this happen than if I had been in America, I think. So on some level, it was personal. I mean, you... you it was very personal. Um, and uh, my reason for uh, dedicating these stels to Malcolm X was very personal. Yes. Okay. All right, then right here...
This is a practical question to end on. I was just wandering around the Philadelphia Art Museum, happened upon your sculptures and was blown away by them. Thought I had to know more about you, so I started reading your books and your poetry. I know you've been married and have children. My question is, do you do it all concurrently and when do you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> I do the best I can. I, um, you know, I mean, people think that I get up in the morning and then I, I run to the studio and I make a little sketch and then I uh, go write a, a little chapter and then um, after lunch I uh, do a poem or, you know, I take a little nap and then I do a poem and then I, with my, you know, feet, I, I do something else. But the fact is that these, um, these different uh, disciplines come at different times in my life, and they certainly come in waves, so that um, I, am, I am going to publish my collected poems, I hope, as by the end of the year. There are 165 poems, uh, which go from 1974, to 2014. Uh, most of them are undated, but uh, I know from, from things that happen in uh, my sculpture or in, uh, you know, in the novels that I can date these poems. But there's, there's a kind of underground which goes from one thing to the other. But uh, there is never, uh, there, there is never this sort of the, the, this sort of division, uh, time-wise, uh, between uh, between one thing and the other. Well, speaking of time, I think we should wrap it up here. I know there are more questions, but Barbara will be staying at the reception. Uh, th this reception, thanks to the French consulate. So, thank you very much for sponsoring that. And of course, the gallery is open, so if you haven't seen the show, if you want to see it again, please go up there, have a glass of wine, say hi to Barbara. Thank you for coming, and thank you, Barbara, for thank everything. You. Thank you, everybody.